This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. This is Rick Renner, and I'm just thrilled that I'm here again today with my friend, Joseph Z. It's good to be here, sir. Welcome, Joseph. Thank you for having me. Friends, I respect this man's ministry, and if you don't know the ministry of Joseph Z., I want you to get familiar with his ministry. And how can they find you? At josephz.com or we're on every form of social media just by looking for Joseph Z. And you go on every morning, 8 o'clock Central Time. I do, yes. And I'm there every day because I get so much out of it. In fact, I watch it every day in amazement because you bring forth such new material every day. Well, thank you. I always sit in my chair and watch and think, how does he do that? But I know how he does it. He gets up really early sets his spiritual sail to catch the wind and does a lot of research. Yes. And wow, it is really valuable. So please look up Joseph Z. But this week, Joseph and I are doing a series called Servants of Fire, and it's about angelic ministry. This material is awesome. What we got into yesterday was wonderful, and today we're going to continue. But the series comes with a study guide. You say, ah, there he goes again about the study guides. (laughs) Well, that's because I really believe that when you read while you see or hear, it reinforces the teaching down deep inside you. I really believe that. And so I want you to get the series, and I want you to get the study guide. And this week only, we're offering you his book, which is called, Servants of Fire, Secrets of the Unseen War and Angels Fighting for You. And in this book, he really says that he wrote this book to help people with their prayer life. Angels are available to help you if you know how to activate their ministry to you. And so friends, please go online or give us a call right now. You can order all of these things and let us know how to pray for you because we're praying for you anyway. But when you tell us how to pray for you, we do a better job at praying. But Joseph, I want us to pick up where we left off yesterday. But let's begin by referring to Hebrews 1, verse 14, where the Bible says, got your Bible? You always use the Bible in this program. Everything in this Bible, this program is based on the Bible. But in Hebrews 1, 14, the writer of Hebrews is talking about angels. And he says, are they not all, all, by the way, all of them, ministering spirits sent forth, dispatched to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. That's me and that's you. Amen. And in Hebrews 12, verse 22, it says that in the church, in the house of God, there are innumerable companies of angels. And therefore, every once in a while, it shouldn't surprise us if we have some kind of an angelic encounter. But many people become obsessed with angels. The Colossians became obsessed. In fact, they begin to worship angels and they begin to intrude into things they really hadn't seen. And it created a mess in the church. And in fact, they were so infatuated with angels that they even began to develop genealogies for angels that did not exist. They began to create names for angels that they had never seen. And it really created a Gnostic mess in the church. Yeah. And Paul wrote to correct it. Well, the truth is they really had a lot of spiritual passion. They had desire. They wanted to really experience things and there's nothing wrong with that. But your experience needs to be based on what the Bible says. Amen. And if you don't know what the Bible says about angelic ministry, you can be deceived. So that's why we need to know the difference between bona fide angels and angels of light. Okay, Joseph, take it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I watch you every day too, Rick. Thank you. I do, and I've learned so much from you, and I'm just so grateful for this ministry. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You know, we've been talking about the Nephilim. We've been talking about all these. Okay, who are Nephilim? Well, they are the fallen ones. They are the ones or the offspring of fallen angels. The Bible or the book of Enoch refers to them, and we covered Enoch last time, about the watchers who came down and basically cohabited with women and created these Wait, monsters. Wait, are you saying 
And I know you're saying, I'm just <laughs> asking like I don't know. Are you saying that angels had sexual relationships with women? That's what I'm saying. And it's possible. That it they, is possible. That they messed with their DNA too. Now, some, some people immediately argue, wait, 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 wait. Jesus said angels are not given in marriage. Well, that's what he said. He didn't say they didn't have the ability to reproduce. Mm -hmm. And when you read Genesis chapter 6 and you read what all the Hebrew scholars said, all the rabbis, and what's even more interesting yeah. is the writings of the early church fathers. Wow. They all affirmed that angels really came down and sexually cohabitated with women. And the women gave birth to monstrous beings. And guess what? The book of Enoch, which we referred to yesterday, infers that they didn't just sleep with women, but they also slept with animals. Yes. And this explains the history of mythology where you have giants. That's right. Where you have mythological creatures. Yes. All of that has a root in something that really happened. It does. And it began in Genesis chapter 6. Well, when you look at Genesis chapter 6 and you watch the well, we'll use that word, nefarious misdeeds that took place. From Genesis chapter 6, suddenly you lunge forward to Genesis chapter 11. Right. And you begin to see the Tower of Babel. And none of that was really an issue beforehand. When you look at... What? That would be the technologies they had, okay. the strange abilities they had. And many people speculate, and I believe it's likely, that the Tower of Babel was a ziggurat. It wasn't just a tower that went all the way you know, up into the heavens beyond, beyond, beyond the atmosphere. That's not what it depicts because it's likely that it was a ziggurat, a temple for worship or access. Some people would use the word a portal. It was, it was actually both. It was both. It was both. Okay. And the, and the early rabbis interestingly wrote that Nimrod, of course, it wasn't too long after the flood, that he didn't just build the Tower of Babel to be a portal or a tower into the heavens, but he wanted to make sure that if God ever sent another flood, mm. he could build something high enough to get him above the water. How about that? And when I read that commentary to my son, Joel, <laughs> Joel said, huh, maybe he should have built a boat. <laughs> he should have built a boat <laughs> or something fireproof. But that really is Jewish commentary on the Tower of Babel. That he was trying to get above another judgment. That's fascinating. It is. It really is. But it's also interesting that they did not have the technology to build that tower until after the angels came down and cohabitated. I, I believe that's the, the way it is because they came down and you read in even the book of Enoch, which we covered and talked about it's not canon, it's not scripture, but it is historical. Now I can hear somebody asking, wait a minute, weren't all those horrible creatures killed in the flood? They were, mm -hmm. but the Bible says clearly they were before and after that. After. That's another subject. We're not going to get into that today. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> and they had the technology to do these things. Now, we read a very interesting scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 15. When Samuel rebuked Saul for what he'd been doing, and he said, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It's interesting, Rick, that he put those two words together. This has everything to do with the Tower of Babel. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So you got rebellion and witchcraft put together. And the question that people would ask is, why? Why is rebellion and witchcraft put together? Well, because rebellion is somebody that violates authority, or they use an unaccessed, or they access a realm they're not supposed to access. It's a rebellion against authority. When it, you couple that with witchcraft, you're looking at an unauthorized access to spiritual authority or spiritual places. Like the word occult. Like the word occult. It really means secret knowledge. Wow. It's people using uh, forbidden practices to penetrate another realm. Wow. It's forbidden, but they, they call it secret knowledge. But it's access that they are not supposed to use. And that's what the Tower of Babel was. The Tower of Babel was access to another realm they weren't supposed to use. Now, there's a lot of things going on in science today, and we could get into some very interesting conversations. Some of that is forbidden access. It is. And science is crossing a line, and it's, it will open a portal for horrible things. It will. It will. 
if it hasn't already, and some of them without going all the way into it, have been on record quoted saying, we can send information into these realms and we're getting information back. And we don't know what's going to come through. It's a fascinating topic, but the point being that when you're looking at what's happening in the Bible, you see that the Tower of Babel is about to be repeated at some point in this culture through this type of nefarious behavior, and it is driven by these demonic fallen angels that want to continue their misdeeds that took place, I believe, at that time. It's interesting to note that the primary emblem of the European Union headquarters is the Tower of Babel. Is that right? Mm -hmm. How about that? It's the Tower of Babel. That's, it's, they're claiming that they're coming back together again. That's fascinating. It's not only fascinating, it's horrible. It's horrifying. <laughs> well, when you look at what's taking place with all that, that happened then and it's beginning to manifest again today in the culture. You see it in pop culture, you see it in television, movies, you see this thing where they open up portals, all these things are happening. It's almost as if the spirit of Antichrist is preparing a generation for that type of wickedness. Now, the answer becomes, how do we stand against it? Well, we need to know how to authorize God's angels to stand on our behalf, how to do these things. But there's a, a deception afoot in the church today and that is where people are either into mysticism, worshiping angels, going and venturing into things they've not seen. And it says in 1 John chapter 2, where it begins to talk about there's an anointing and then there's a false anointing. 1 John chapter 2 speaks of those that have a false anointing. It represents that. And that word, and you could help me with this, in the Greek I think is like a pseudo anointing, something that is false or like the anointing, represents itself like the anointing. The reason that's scary is because when you have a lot of people in the body of Christ speaking about sensational things that are happening and opening up doors to sensational experiences, not basing it on the Word of God, you're opening yourself up to angels of light, and then you're opening yourself up also to the spirit of the age that wants to usher in the kind of darkness we're talking about. A lot of the things you're talking about can be seen on YouTube. True. I mean, YouTube is just loaded with crazy stuff. It, it is. People that say they've had an experience that does not match scripture. Right. Or they've been to heaven and seen something that it just proves to me they never went to heaven. I mean, just a lot of nonsense. Yes. The word Always God. come back to the Bible. The Bible. Always. Okay, go ahead. Well, the issue with this is, is that we've got to continue to stand on the Word of God. And if there's a counterfeit, there's always a real. And that's the part that encourages me about this topic, because you might, some people might be hearing this and saying, this is sensational. I've never heard anything like this. Well, you're going to hear it more and more in the church. It's becoming a popular topic. But the answer is the same. We need to come back to the Word of God. We need to learn to authorize real angelic warriors to stand up. And I believe they will not fall. They will not ever rebel again because they saw what happened to their mutinous brothers. They were driven into gloomy dungeons. They were put underground. They were placed in, in places of difficulty like under the Euphrates River. And these kind of things, I believe angels watched the ark. Now, when you recognize... Angels watch what? They watch the story ark. Okay. But... They did also watch the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. Because when we recognize that angels long to look into these things, or as the scripture teaches us, and you could help us with this, Rick, things angels desire to look into. Can I tell you about that? Would you please? This is another reason why it shouldn't surprise us if angels show up in church meetings. Mm. Because in Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Right. He's talking about preaching the gospel and the good news of the gospel, which things angels desire to look into. It's amazing. That phrase, desire to look into, describes angels hanging low mm. with their necks stretched out, everything in them wanting to peer down into our services. Wow. Because we are experiencing things they are unable to experience. They've never experienced redemption. They've never experienced the glory of God like we do. They've never been saved. They, there's just things we have that they have never experienced. I say it's like a little boy trying to look over a picket fence. He gets up on his toes. He stretches as far as he can just to get a peek over the top. That's what it means when it says angels earnestly desire to look into, they're just trying to get a peek. They're hovering low to see what's going on in church, what's going on in the lives of believers. And so if you look up and see an angel every once in a while, well, they're there. They're there. They're there whether you see them or not. Peter says they are there. That's amazing. Well, I've thought about this a lot, 
that angels want to look into things. First of all, I believe that also has some references to the Ark of the Covenant, how the cherubim's wings were together and they were looking at the presence of God, that I know they were molded angels on the Ark of the Covenant, but it could also be that there was actual cherubim represented there, looking at the presence of God. And then they see God manifest in the flesh. Well, the Bible tells us that when Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, served his lot and went into the temple, there was an angel there. It's amazing. And so they saw the whole story arc. We know in the book of Job, that angels, the sons of God, shouted for joy as God was creating the earth. I get a, a, a wonderful image of that as God is blowing the vast expanse of space into place and he's, he's putting the stars out there. And I think the angels began to shout and the Lord would say to them, you want to see more boys? You want more? And they're it, like, yeah. It was the original big bang. That's right. And God said, <laughs> bang. <laughs> That's right. Talk about presentation. <laughs> the Lord began to open it up and he said, bang. I believe he took them to the earth and began to create all the living things. It's interesting when you go to Job chapter 4, there's a very unique encounter that happens there in Job chapter 4 with Eliphaz, one of the guys that, you know, was Job's counselors. And Eliphaz is there and suddenly as Eliphaz is in a moment, he said a spirit passed before his face. The hair on his body stood up. Something happened where Eliphaz had an encounter. And in this encounter, he began to hear muttering. He couldn't quite make out what he was looking at, but he began to, began to hear muttering. And what I believe this was is when you get the narrative of what this muttering began to say, it went like this. How can a maker make something like man and they die so easy? How can they be like a moth that goes towards a flame and just dies? They're, they're weak. They die. He puts, and he, and he puts charge against his angels but not against this weak little dirt-bound vessel, man. And this, this hatred towards mankind began to come out and spew as Eliphaz is listening to this like eavesdropping of a conversation that was taking place. And I believe that was Lucifer or Satan at the time, wandering about speaking rhetorically to himself about his hatred for mankind. Because it's in the book of Job narrative, we know the devil was there. And the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? All these things. Then here he is going on and on about Eliph or in front of Eliphaz about mankind. Now, is all of that in this book? It's in this book. I already knew that. <laughs> my friends, you need this book. It is remarkable. Okay. And as he's going on about this, it gave me a thought, an insight. I believe the reason that the devil became so against humanity or against God is because God elevated man above him. He did. He did. And that's why the devil wanted in the garden. That's it. Because the garden had previously been where Satan had, Lucifer had walked upon the holy stones and he had had his own throne. That's another entire teaching. It is. <laughs> and God made a man of dirt and put him in authority in the very place where Lucifer once had exercised authority. It was the ultimate slap of the <laughs> devil to put a dirt creature in his former place. That is amazing. And the devil was bound and determined to take him down. I think so. I believe that rage filled his heart. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to kill this what you love. I'm going to attack it. And uh, the Lord just, he created Adam in his image and likeness as a dirt bound being. Oh, that's who we are. That's who we are. No wonder in Psalm chapter 5 it says, What is man that's your mind. That thou art mindful of him? <laughs> we are amazing beings made in the image of God. Friend, you just need to say about yourself, I'm amazing. Praise God. God did an amazing thing. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, Paul writes about your body. He says, ah, Our bodies are vessels that contain the Holy Spirit. The word have in Greek is the word echo. It means I have, I hold, I possess. I say that if X marks the spot for a buried treasure, well, X marks the spot. There's a big X on us. We have in us buried treasure. God put the Spirit of God in us. That's what we have in us. That is amazing. It is amazing. God loves us so much. He loves us as much as He loves Jesus. 
Yes. He does. We're in Christ. We're in Christ. And he loves us. And these fallen angels, demonic entities, all this stuff, they hate humanity. You have such a good teaching on that, how uh, the way demonic entities try to get mankind embarrassed and, you know, unclothed and all these things. But the point is, darkness hates humanity because it's mad at God. It's like a bunch of rebellious children that just want to hurt the Creator. Mm. And I'll tell you what. When we authorize angels, we go to prayer, we begin to activate them according to their purpose. I think they're ecstatic. They're like looking at it in a way that says, we get to authorize the gospel. We get to stand up for the covenant of God. But how do you authorize? How do you activate angels? By praying the word of God. Because angels, they are divided by the voice of God. Okay, Psalm give me an example. Just do it for me. Well, if we begin to pray. So, for example, I would say the Lord gives his angels charge over me. Psalm 91. I take Psalm 34 and I say the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. I fear God. The angel of the Lord encamps around. And suddenly that verse activates. I believe it. Angelic assistance. That's right. They hear that because they're servants of fire. Hebrews 1, it says that. These servants of fire activate and they go into what they were created for. To serve the Word of God, to serve God, and now God lives in us. He does not give aid to angels. He gives aid to the seed of Abraham. That's Christ Jesus. We're in Christ Jesus. We speak the Word of God. Christ Jesus is the Word of God. We speak that. Angels have no choice but to, with enthusiasm, serve that Word. Mm. And Psalm 29 verse 7 says, the voice of God divides them, sends them out in rank and file. They begin to do it. And I'll tell you, anytime we speak the Word of God in a promise, they're activated, especially when it relates to them, I believe. When it relates to them, out of the Psalms, Psalm 103, Psalm 91, Psalm 29, you begin to recognize it's powerful. Psalm 34, when the righteous cry out, the Lord hears them, and the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Mm. I believe they activate for you. In their hands, they take you up. And so our friends that are listening to us today, they can do this themselves? They can do it right now. They can do it themselves, yes, by praying the Word of God, by speaking to I just want to say something to you right now. If you're watching this right now, you can pray the Word of God. Find a promise in the Scripture. Find the Psalms. Begin to pray it out loud. Begin to activate angels. They will hear and activate. When you pray in the Holy Spirit, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak in the tongues of men, and of angels. You begin to talk about that. You begin to prophesy in the tongues of men and angels with a spirit of faith, and God will begin to release angels on your behalf. Now, here's an example of how you need to listen very carefully. Joseph did not say pray to angels. No, I did not. Never said that, would never say that. He said, just quote the Word of God. That's right. And when you quote the Word of God, that activates angelic ministry. But you don't pray to angels. Never. You just quote the word and bam, angels are activated. But we're out of time. Tomorrow we're going to come back. Oh, yes. We're going to wrap this up. Unfortunately, I'm having a blast. I am too, Rick. And I pray that you're enjoying this. But we'll be back in just a moment. And Joseph and I are going to pray for you. God has dispatched angels, servants of fire, to assist and help believers. Joseph Z and Rick Renner sat down to delve into the subject of angelic ministry that is available to the church and you and how to activate their service in the life of every believer. This powerful five-part series with Joseph Z and Rick Renner covers topics like exactly who and what are angels, exactly who and what are fallen angels, the hierarchy of angels, what angels do and what they do not do. This incredible series is available in digital and physical format starting at just $10. We're also offering you Joseph Z's book, Servants of Fire, Secrets of the Unseen War, and Angels Fighting for You. Servants of Fire delivers sound biblical instruction to unveil the realm of the Spirit and bring to pass the will, plans, and purposes of God on the earth. It dives deep into the subject of angels and makes it all understandable to those who have hungry hearts and want to experience angelic ministry. Rick Renner says, I've read a lot of books about angels over the years, but this is the best, most comprehensive and helpful book I've ever read on this subject. It was so captivating that I read it from cover to cover in a single setting. Anyone who wants to understand the realm of angels and their ministry to us needs to read this book. Order Servants of Fire today for $22. Don't miss this special offer, the five-part series Servants of Fire and the book Servants of Fire by Joseph Z. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now.
This is Rick Renner and my friend, I'm coming to you from what's going to be the new studio in our building in Moscow. And just recently, our team moved into this building. They wandered through the hallways in amazement at what God has provided. And I wanna say thank you to you because God used you to make this dream come to pass. And I also want to say thank you for the way that you're helping us to retire the debt on the Tulsa building. I know people don't get excited about retiring debt, but I do because once that debt is taken care of on the Tulsa building, suddenly all of those finances are going to be released to enable us to take the teaching of the Bible further to the ends of the earth. And just like we're now occupying this building, praise God, we're occupying the Tulsa building. There are people everywhere, employees that are taking calls, answering letters, responding to emails. That office is about ministering to people and ministering to our partners. We are a ministry that is extremely serious about taking care of people. If you've ever reached out to us, you know that when you call us, you really get prayed for. That's a very serious part of our ministry. And when we retire the debt on that wonderful Tulsa building, suddenly money will be released so we can take the teaching of the Bible through all kinds of media to the very ends of the earth. And between this office here and the office in Tulsa and our team around the world, my friends, God's grace is enabling us to do more than we would have ever thought or imagined possible. But that's what the grace of God does. It empowers us to do what we could never do by ourselves. And I wanna say thank you to you again for your part. And if you're not already a part of the giving team to help us retire that debt, would you please pray about becoming part of the giving team and together we can retire that debt and move on so that then we can take the teaching of the Bible even further to the very ends of the earth. That's our call. Proverbs 10, 21 says, the lips of the righteous feed many, and together with your help, we're feeding many people all over the world the wonderful Word of God. And I wanna say thank you in advance for being a part of our giving team. Well, today we have had a good time. I'm talking about me and Joseph Z and you. Have you enjoyed today's program? Well, tomorrow we're going to wrap it up and tomorrow we're going to really focus on what you can do to activate angelic ministry in your life or in the life of your family. It's going to be good. But please order the entire series, which is called Servants of Fire. It's five parts and it comes with a wonderful study guide. And we're also offering you this week only and tomorrow will be the last day that we offer it. And it's called Servants of Fire. It's by Joseph Z. The back of the book says Deploying God's Angelic Army. There really is an angelic army, innumerable numbers of angels that are available. And very often they just stand by because they're just waiting for somebody to activate their assistance and believers don't do it. So the angels just stand and watch, waiting, wishing that we would activate their service. And that's what we're gonna talk about tomorrow. But Joseph, let's pray. Father, we thank you in the thank name of Jesus. Jesus that angels really have been sent on assignment for us. Thank you, Lord. Teach us from the word of God how to activate angelic ministry and that we would experience everything they have to do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, we'll see you tomorrow, but remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, which says, where the word of a king is, there is power. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.